Hey, good afternoon everyone. It's a real red lecture day in my career to be invited here to deliver the inaugural uh, Jean Bannis Surprise Lecture from the Physiological Society. So the lecture was set up in 2016 to commemorate the life and the work of Jean Bannister, who was a distinguished physiologist and educator at the University of Oxford. Uh, now I've had the intense pleasure of learning a little bit more about Jean Bannister from one of her former colleagues, the, the formidable Hilary Brown at Oxford. And from Hilary Brown, I learned that Jean Bannister is remembered by many for her, to, uh, for her tireless devotion to physiology and her support of early career, career physiologists, especially, but not exclusively, young women. Um, and um, what really struck a chord is that Jean Bannister's former mentees, including Hilary Brown, Dario Di Francesco and Susan Noble, went on to discover concepts fundamental to modern understanding of pacemaker electrophysiology, which is the focus of my talk. And for engineering this connection to the historical greats, I'm forever indebted to the society. So my lecture today is titled Getting Excited About Pacemaking in the Athletic Heart. And I hope by the end of this lecture, you'd be a little bit more excited about cardiac excitability. So to set the scene, I'd like to take you back to the year 420 BC and the time of the Greco-Persian War. And it was during this time that Pheidippides, a professional running messenger, was sent to Sparta to request the help of the Spartans when the Persians landed at Marathon. So legend has it that Pheidippides ran 240 kilometers in two days. He then ran 26 miles from the Battle of Marathon to Athens to proclaim Greek victory over the Persians. Rejoice we conquer, he said, and keeled over and died. And in the words of the poet Robert Browning, the joy in his blood burst his heart. So a most radical view of physiology. But I think we can agree that the notion that too much exercise is not a good idea for the heart seems to be as old as exercise itself. Fast forward to, uh, sorry, to the modern day, and public participation in endurance events is on the rise. And more than ever, you have people participating in ultra-endurance events like long-distance marathons and triathlons. Um, in 2010, there were over 500 race starts in Europe and America and over a million participants each year. And these numbers really provide the impetus for the clinician and the policymaker to fully understand the effects of intense exercise on the heart. But one thing is clear, quite simply put, exercise is medicine and quite possibly the physician's most effective intervention. Um, regular moderate exercise has been shown to alleviate complications in a variety of maladies, including diabetes, depression, uh, osteoporosis, coronary heart disease, the list is endless. Let's consider this study of 416,000 adults followed for a mean of about eight years. So as you can see, about 40 minutes of exercise, 40 to 50 minutes of daily physical activity, reduces all-cause mortality by almost 40%, which is really very powerful, after which, however, a point of diminishing returns is reached. When it comes to the heart, this is going the wrong way. When it comes to the heart, several large-scale observational clinical trials have consistently shown an improvement in cardiovascular outcomes with regular moderate exercise. However, there appears to be a point at which the improvement in cardiovascular endpoints starts to plateau or even decrease due to an increased risk of arrhythmic complications. This could be atrial and ventricular tachyarrhythmias, for example, atrial fibrillation, but also disorders of the cardiac conduction system, manifesting as bradyarrhythmias and heart block due to intrinsic electrophysiological remodeling of the cardiac conduction system, which is the focus of today's lecture. So I'd like to provide a brief primer on the anatomy and physiology of the cardiac conduction system, which doesn't get quite as much press as the working myocardium. So the cardiac conduction system is a series of specialized tissues in the heart responsible for the initiation and conduction of the heartbeat. The main components of the conduction system are the sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node, and the Hispakinji system given here in purple. So dysfunction of any three parts of the cardiac conduction system is potentially life-threatening and can necessitate electronic pacemaker implantation. So the cardiac action potential is generated in the sinus node, which is at the back wall of the right atrium. Uh, now the atria and the ventricles are separated by a ring of fibrous tissue, and the only electrical connection is through the atrioventricular node. Dysfunction of the sinus node can result in a very low resting heart rate, also known as sinus bradycardia, but can also manifest as alternating periods of tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, and also things like sinus pauses or sinus arrest. 
Now, on the right, you'll see that there's significant differences in action potential morphology in the conduction system and the working myocardium. And I'd like to consider these in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Oop. So I like to think of pacemaking as an orchestrated response of a symphony of iron channels. And all the major players in this um, symphony are given on this slide here. And together, they're referred to as the membrane and the calcium clock mechanisms of pacemaking. In the interest of time, I'd like to consider phase four um, of the uh, sinus node action potential. So uh, phase, during phase four of the action potential uh, occurs a phenomenon known as diastolic depolarization, which, is no, which has been known for some time, since the 40s probably, to be the hallmark of spontaneously active cardiac tissue. And what diastolic depolarization allows is the triggering of an action potential when the threshold potential is reached. And this allows for repetitive activity. So there's two key features contributing to the pacemaker potential. One, notice that in the atrial muscle, the resting membrane potential is stable. It's at about minus 80 millivolts. And this is set at, because of these ion channels known as uh, the KIR 2.1 channels that carry a background inward rectifier potassium current. Now, these channels are absent in the sinoatrial node. The resting membrane potential of the sinoatrial node is um, unstable and, uh, and it's uh, at about minus 60 millivolts. And this sets the scene for pacemaking. A very important ionic current in the pacemaker potential is the funny current, also known as IF. And this is a mixed sodium potassium current activated on hyperpolarization in the diastolic range of voltages. Um, so uh, the degree of activation of the funny current at the end of an action potential uh, determines the slope of the pacemaker potential and thus the threshold of action potential firing. So if you were thinking of an orchestra, I'd like for you to think of the funny current as the first violin. It's a key player in pacemaking. So the funny current is carried by the HCN channels, and there are three isoforms in humans and rodents, and HCN 1, 2, and 4, of which HCN 4 is the predominant isoform. This is an immunohistochemistry image uh, with an antibody labeling HCN4. And as you can see, it is specifically uh, expressed in the sinoatrial node and absent in the atrial muscle and in the rest of the working myocardium. Now, down regulation of HCN4 and reduction of the funny current is known to underlie pathological bradycardias, for example, in heart failure. And also, mutation of the HCN channel results in inherited bradyrhythmias altogether suggesting the existence of a general mechanism of heart rhythm disturbances based on altered expression of the HCN4 channels and down regulation of the funny current. So let us now return to athletic training. What is the evidence linking long-term endurance exercise and disorders of the cardiac conduction system? And I'd like to consider three studies. So here's a study published in the 80s in 20 endurance runners versus controls. So in this, um, in this cohort, there was an increased incidence of bradyarrhythmias with heart rates as low as 35 beats per minute, asystolic pauses and complete heart block. Slightly bigger than study this time in 134 former Swiss professional cyclists that had competed in the Tour de Suisse uh, versus golfers. There was an increased incidence of sinus node disease, pacemaker implantation for bradyarrhythmias and also ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And finally, um, in a study of 52,000 long-distance cross-country skiers, there was an increased risk of hospitalization for bradyarrhythmias, which interestingly correlated with relative finishing time. And there was an, also an increased risk of atrial fibrillation, again correlated with relative finishing time. So if I were being provocative, I'd go so far as to say that some veteran athletes represent a subpopulation of acquired cardiac conduction system disease. So what underlies this effect? Now to study the relationship between endurance exercise and heart rhythm disturbances, we initially focused on the most common arrhythmia, sinus bradycardia, or a low resting heart rate. So to put things in context, if we were to take our pulse, I think the average in this room, not counting those already asleep at the back, would be about 70 beats per minute. But in elite athletes, for example, Olympians like Sir Chris Hoy, it can be as low as 30 beats per minute. So what underlies this effect? Well, the prevailing view is that with endurance exercise comes an increased activity of the autonomic nervous system and an increased activity of the vagus nerve that slows down the heart. However, there is substantial evidence to the contrary. For example, let's look at the study non-athletes versus rowers. So following the red lines, if you look at the baseline heart rates between non-athletes and rowers, 
So you see a difference about 10 beats per minute. Now under complete pharmacological block with a combination of atropine and propranolol, the heart rate difference is not smaller, but is almost double, thereby negating any influence of high vagal tone and suggesting intrinsic remodeling of the sinoatrial node of the heart that sets the heart rate. So this is what we decided to investigate using animal models. So we have two models of endurance exercise. One is an intensity controlled treadmill running model uh, developed by Professor Ulrich Wisloff at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So my, uh, the rats are uh, trained on a treadmill which is dynamically adjusted according to maximal VO2 max. And they run for an hour five times a week for three months. We also have a model in house of swim training. So mice are swim trained like so for 60 minutes twice a day for 28 days. Now, both these models produce several features of human endurance exercise, for, for example, improved skeletal muscle oxidative capacity, uh, left ventricle hypertrophy, and perhaps most significantly to the present study, a significant resting bradycardia evidenced by ECG. So in, this model, we decide, in these models, we decided to look at the vagal tone hypothesis. And what we found, just like in the preceding human study I just showed you, that even under complete block of the autonomic nervous system, the heart rate of trained animals was still significantly lower. And by sequential block of the sympathetic and parasympathetic arms of the autonomic nervous system, we found no role for heightened vagal tone in underlying sinus bradycardia. We then studied the sinus node in isolation. Here it is beating away happily. And what we found that it was the spontaneous beating weight of the isolated sinoatrial node was significantly lower in trained animals compared to controls, altogether showing us that exercise training induces an intrinsic sinus bradycardia. We then measured expression levels of the key pacemaking channel HCN4 and the other isoforms, and we found significant down regulations in all the isoforms of the HCN channel. We then looked at protein expression of the HCN channel, and once again, it was down regulated. And as is expected with the down regulation of message and protein, the function of this channel, i.e. the current density carried by the HCN channels, was also significantly reduced in trained animals, altogether showing us that it is reduced expression of the pacemaker channel HCN4 and the funny current IF, which underlies training-induced sinus bradycardia. So what happens when we block IF? So we used um, the IF selective blocker Evabridine, which is known to dose dependently reduce heart rate in humans and animals. And on application of Evabridine under complete autonomic block, we found that this completely negated the heart rate difference between trained and controlled animals, suggesting the predominance of HCN4 remodeling in underlying sinus bradycardia. We also looked at the relationship between the evabridine effect given here as the drop in heart rate after evabridine application plotted against the intrinsic heart rate after complete autonomic block. So if you look at the red circles which represent the trained animals, not only do they have a lower intrinsic heart rate, but their responsiveness to evabridine is also lower, once again showing the predominance of the HCN4 remodeling effect in underlying sinus bradycardia. So we're fortunate enough that in collaboration with clinical colleagues, we can test some of our findings in human athletes. Obviously, what can be done in the healthy human athlete is very limited, but we did test some of our theories in a small cohort of human athletes. So after complete autonomic block, the heart rate of human athletes, again, is significantly lower, just as we've seen in mice in the previous study in rowers. And this really negates any role for high vagal tone in modulating training-induced bradycardia. And much like in mice, the Vabardine effect is severely blunted um, in general in human athletes, altogether showing us that HCN4 remodeling is at play in the human sinus node in athletic training. So what happens in the long term? Because it is in the veteran athlete that pacemaker implantation becomes a problem, and also they're susceptible to other conditions where uh, uh, reminding us that the cardiac conduction system might be dysfunctional as, as veteran athletes are more prone to heart block, um, which implies dysfunction of the atrioventricular node. So we uh, instituted a long-term swim train model. So mice were sw swim trained for five months to mimic long-term training in the human. And this time, along with sinus bradycardia, we also had a prolongation of the PR interval, the AV node effective refractory period, and the wenke back cycle length, altogether suggesting <coughs> that conduction through the atrioventricular node is becoming dysfunctional in the long term. 
Now, any clinicians in the audience might say that prolongation of the PR interval is relatively benign. However, previous work has shown that a PR prolongation portends to adverse consequences, including an increased risk of pacemaker implantation and an increased risk of atrial fibrillation as well. So with all this in mind, we embarked on a study of the mouse atrial ventricular node, which quite simply we refer to as the Cinderella of the heart. A very simply, but it's a tiny shred of tissue nestled between the atrial and the ventricular septum, presenting significant methodological challenges in, in accurate sampling. So in a technique developed by Helena Dobrinsky in our lab, we have to go through a series of steps, including histological identification, immunolabeling with HCN4, and laser capture microdissection to adequately sample atrioventricular node tissue. And in doing so, we, what we discovered that many of the major players, remember the orchestra and all the different play, ion channels involved, a massive down-regulation of many ion channel families involved in AV node impulse generation and conduction. So the data is given on this graph here, and this is the trained value normalized to the sedentary value. So anything corresponding to this line, um, which is one, represents no change. So here we see a sweeping down-regulation of many key ion channels in the atrioventricular node. So the theory we're leaning towards, and this is a study ongoing in our lab, is that ion channel remodeling of the atrioventricular node is sufficient explanation for heart block in the long term. So just to recap this part of the talk, here's a, a work summarized for us by the BBC a few years ago when this paper was published, that endurance exercise interferes with heart rhythm. There is electrophysiological remodeling of a key pacemaking ion channel, HCN4, and this underlies sinus bradycardia. In the long term, the remodeling is not just restricted to the cardiac pacemaker, but occurs elsewhere in the heart, and this explains a higher incidence of pacemaker implantation in the veteran athlete. So something we're particularly interested in the moment is what's causing or what's driving the system of ion channel and HCN4 down regulation. And to answer this question, we've started looking upstream. And when you look upstream, you come across microRNAs. Now, microRNAs require a little introduction, uh, but they're a class of small non-coding RNAs known to exert very significant effects in a variety of conditions within the heart, a variety of uh, processes in the heart, including cardiogenesis, hypertrophy, failure, and arrhythmogenesis. So very briefly, a microRNA gene, which can be in an intronic location within a protein coding gene, encodes for a primary transcript, which has a stem loop structure, this undergoes cleavage by dicer. The dicer cleavage product is then nestled within a ribonuclear protein, exported out of the nucleus, where it can bind to mRNAs, um, uh, including on the three prime untranslated region of the mRNA with a, base, a, a complementary base pairing, cause, causing mRNA cleavage or translational attenuation. Now, very little is known about microRNAs in the conduction system and less so about the conduction system in athletic training. So we kind of had the feel to ourselves when we started this work. So we decided to adopt an unbiased approach of finding dysregulated microRNAs in the trained sinus node with next generation sequencing. And from the, with this approach, we found changes in about 30 different microRNAs. Now, the, the reasoning being that an upregulation of a microRNA would result in a downregulation of the key pacemaker ion channel ATN4. We focus on the upregulated microRNAs. And computationally, the top predicted target to affect the ATN4 gene was the microRNA 4235P. So we started looking at this microRNA in a little bit more detail. We found that it was preferentially upregulated in the sinus node, did nothing in the atria of the ventricle, and was reversed by detraining. Also, when we looked at the relationship between HCN4 mRNA and the amount of this microRNA present, as expected, we observed a significant negative correlation. And interestingly, there was also a negative correlation between the intrinsic heart rate of trained animal, of animals and the amount of um, microRNA 423 present in the sinus node, suggesting that microRNA 423 does target the, the, the key pacemaking channel, HCN4, and this has an effect on intrinsic heart rate. So we tested direct interactions between uh, the microRNA and the HCN4 three prime untranslated region using a, a luciferase reporter gene assay. <coughs> Again, this technique requires, requires a little introduction, but very briefly. We use the plasmid in which luciferase is driven as constitutively active under a CMV promoter. And within this plasmid, we subclone the HCN4 3' untranslated region. 
So what then this pl plasma then produces is a chimeric mRNA in which the gene for luciferase is under the control of the HCN43 prime untranslated region. Specific binding of the microRNA then causes an attenuation in the luciferase signal, which is then alleviated by mutating the binding site. So when we tested this, so here's the luciferase plasmid co-transfected with a precursor to microRNA 423. And as expected, we saw a drop in the luciferase signal that was dose dependent. And this drop was then relieved by mutating the corresponding binding site, suggesting direct interactions between the key pacemaking channel HCN4 and microRNA 423. So now that we've started building some confidence in the relationship between HCN4 and MER 423, we decided to adopt a loss of function approach using something called an antagomere or an antimere, which is a commercially available oligo that specifically silences the microRNA. So mice were swim just as normal for 28 days, and the, at the end of the training period, they received 80 milligrams per kilogram uh, on three occasions of this antimere. And we were staggered to find that application of the antagomere completely reversed the heart rate difference between trained and control animals, and also completely normalized the intrinsic sinus bradycardia within the sinoatrial node. The next question was, is this, is this because of HCN4 reverse remodeling? So we measured HCN4 levels in our antagomere group, and once again, we found that a restoration of um, HCN4 message levels, although there was this intriguing rebound beyond pre-training levels. And as with message in protein, we were also able to find that the current density of IF uh, was completely restored by antimere treatment. So at this point, we started to get quite excited, as this is the first demonstration of microRNA control of a key pacemaking ion channel and microRNA control of heart rate. However, as you know, the reviewers are always sharpening their knives. And one of the reviewers decided that the more pertinent question was what was controlling the microRNA. So just as we were finding our feet in the area of microRNA regulation, we sort of flung into the lion's den of transcriptional control, which is far more complicated. Now you will know that the rate of transcription of DNA to RNA is controlled by certain proteins called transcription factors that bind to transcription factor binding sites that can be either proximal or distal to a transcription start site. Now transcription factors can either act alone or in a complex or in a cis regulatory mod mod module to either suppress or enhance the binding of RNA polymerase and the, sorry, the recruitment of RNA polymerase and therefore the transcription of genes. So it's a really complicated picture and to be honest, we're tasked with finding a needle in a haystack. But we decided to give it a go. So we initially looked at transcriptional control of microRNA 423, the host gene of microRNA 423, which is a protein, uh, which is a gene called NSRP1. So microRNA 423 is in the first intron of NSRP1. And interestingly, they both transcribe in the same direction, suggesting they might be potentially co-regulated. A further clue came from the fact that NSRP1 is also significantly upregulated in the trained sinus node, again suggesting co-regulation. So under the hypothesis that they might share common promoter elements, we started looking at 2KB of the promoter region of this host gene. So bioinformatically, there were over 400 potential transcription factors that could bind to this region. Now on the basis of p-values and uh, evolutionary conservation, we've narrowed it down to the top 96 and profile these uh, 96 transcription factors using a medium throughput TACMAN low density array approach. And we found changes in about 14 transcription factors. Now very infrequently in science, certain situations conspire to your advantage. And we chanced upon a set of four transcription factors that are known to act in the heart to play key roles in cardiac development. And at the center of this signaling mechanism was a transcription factor NKX 2.5, which has previously been shown when overexpressed to cause sick sinus syndrome and um, induce a contractile phenotype causing sinus node dysfunction. So what we're finding now with promoter luciferase approaches and overexpression studies in the lab is that upregulation of NKX 2.5 explains an upregulation of NSRP1 and 4235P which down-regulates HCN4 and causes sinus bradycardia.
So very briefly to summarize this part of the talk, we've seen that elect there's electrophysiological remodeling of the key pacemaking ion channel in the sinus node. We're now starting to understand the upstream mechanisms that drive this remodeling and cause down regulation of HCN4. And from our antagamer work, we're leaning towards the theory that microRNA directed approaches may re represent a therapeutic target for a uh, bradyarrhythmias and to rescue HCN4 down regulation in the athlete. So I'd like to spend the rest of the talk um, telling you about a parallel study in the lab, something we're particularly excited about, and it's to do with the circadian control of heart rate. Now, part of the joy of working in the athletic training field is that we often get correspondence from athletes who are very interested in their own super physiology. So here's a letter from an athlete. He says he's a veteran athlete age 49, running fairly constantly since the age of 14. He says he's had a lower than average heart rate which is expected, and he's recently had two 24-hour tape tests, suggesting that he's now symptomatic. Now, these tape tests showed that whilst he slept, his heart rate dropped significantly. In the first test, he had a nocturnal pause of 5.4 seconds. That's quite a long pause between heartbeats. And the second test, he had a sinus rhythm of 14 nocturnal episodes of second-degree atrioventricular block. And in the second test, his heartbeat at night dropped to 12 beats per minute. So we're sort of horrified and excited in equal measure, as this is exactly the kind of thing we were thinking about in the lab at the time. There is a circadian rhythm in heart rate in the human, and the heart rate of athletes can be especially low at night. And interestingly, there's also an increased incidence of bradyarrhythmias and heart block in the athlete at night. So what underlies this effect? And very much like training-induced sinus bradycardia, it's all entirely attributed to heightened vagal tone at night, which is not an unreasonable proposition. However, playing devil's advocate, there is some evidence suggesting this might not be the whole story. So let's consider these two studies of cardiac transplant recipients. Now, cardiac transplant involves surgical interruption of the vagus nerve and surgical interruption of the postganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers traveling from the stellate ganglion to the myocardium. So we're talking about an extrinsically denervated heart. And in these hearts, you still have a preservation of the circ of a circadian rhythm and heart rate. Now, one caveat to this is that the possibility of re-innovation. However, this is known to be patchy, occurring up to 40 to 70% of cases, and vagal re really only occurs in the literature after two years. So it doesn't fully explain the circadian variation in these cardiac transplant recipients. So could it be that there is a circadian oscillation in pacemaking ion channels and this underlies the occurrence of bradyarrhythmias at night. And this is a theory we tested, and this paper is also under review at Circulation Research at the moment. So we studied circadian rhythms and heart rate in the mouse, and here's data from telemetrized mice uh, recorded over two days. And you can see these beautiful sinusoidal variations in heart rate. As you know, mice are nocturnal, and the heart rate at night is significantly higher than that during the day. And here I introduce the concept of Zeitgeber, which is a term borrowed from circadian biologists. Very simply, it means ZT0 is the start of the light period or the time where mice are inactive or asleep. And ZT12 is the start of the dark period when mice are awake. So the question we ask, is sinus node electrophysiology different at ZT0 and 12? So we looked at the isolated heart and we found that the spontaneous beating rate of the sinus node was significantly higher at ZT12 when the mice would have been awake. And the same was true in the isolated sinus node, significantly higher heart rates at ZT12. We then looked at our favorite key pacemaking ion channel, ATN4, and by sampling at various time points, we found significant circadian variations in the expression levels of ATN4 message and protein. And my colleague Yan Wen Wang made a startling discovery that even in isolated myocytes, the clock keeps ticking, and the current density of IF carried by these cells was significantly different and varied in a circadian manner. So what drives this circadian oscillation of this pacemaking ion channel? Well, circadian rhythms, which are really a fascinating field of physiology, are based on a hierarchy of intrinsic molecular clocks that maintain an internal timekeeping of roughly 24 hours in the absence of any external cues. Now, the master clock is um, based on the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. It receives light signals from the retina 
and, it doing, and in doing so synchronizes peripheral oscillators present in pretty much every tissue of the body, including the heart, using systemic and uh, neuroendocrine cues. Uh, at the core of the, at the molecular level, uh, circadian rhythms are based on a transcriptional, post-translational feedback loop. And at the center of this loop are the transcription factors clock and BMAL1. So clock and BMAL1 are transcribed, they translocate to the nucleus from a heterodimer, and they act on EBOX enhancer sites of um, uh, other transcription factors, such as cri uh, cryptochrome or cry and period or per and increase their transcription. Cry and per are then translocated out of the nucleus, they undergo phosphorylation, they translocate back into the nucleus and act on a BMAL clock heterodimer inhibiting its effect and forming a negative feedback loop. And this whole cycle takes about 24 hours and what these clock genes do is they drive rhythms in gene expression by rhythmic regulation of promoter activity of thousands of clock control genes. So two key questions for us. One, is this system present within the sinoatrial node? And two, is ATN4 a clock control gene? So we tested the presence of an intrinsic circadian clock within the sinoatrial node by sampling um, tissues at various time points. And we measured the expression of BMAL and clock mRNA, these key clock transcription factors. And sure, sure enough, we found these lovely circadian variations in their message levels. Now, we were also able to directly measure active clock machinery in the sinus node by using a mouse in which the gene for PER, the key clock transcription factor PER, was fused to the gene for luciferase. So we obtained the sinus nodes from these mice and maintained them in culture for about 72 hours and recorded the lum a bioluminescent signal using a photomultiplier tube. And what we found is these uh, sinusoidal um, variations or os oscillations in luciferase activity showing for the first time active clock machinery within the sinoatrial node. Now incapacitating the circadian clock by knocking out the transcription factor cry in a cry knockout mouse completely obliterated the circadian variation in uh, period two bioluminescence. Once again showing specific active clock machinery within the sinus node. So the next question was, can the clock then control ATN4? Here's the crystal structure of the clock BMAL heterodimer binding to an E-box enhancer site on a gene. And we wanted to ask whether this system was present in the ATN4 gene as well. Now, computationally, there were about eight different E-box binding sites in the ATN4 gene. And using chromatin immunoprecipitation, we tested whether there was specific binding between BMAL and the ATN4 E boxes. So very briefly, we overexpressed histag BMAL and cross-linked the cells to preserve DNA protein interactions. These were then somnicated and immunoprecipitated using an antibody directed against the histag. And what we found was chip enrichment of two uh, E box binding sites on the ATN4 gene showing direct interactions between the circadian clock, the peripheral circadian clock, and the key pacemaking ion channel, ATN4. We went one step further and looked at a cardiomyocyte specific BMAL knockout, and these were mice generated by crossing a BMAL flox flox mouse with an alpha myosin heavy chain Cree mouse, which specifically knocks down BMAL and cardiomyocytes, and in these mice, the circadian variation in IF current density was completely normalized and the circadian variation in intrinsic heart rate was also completely normalized. So what we found is a new oscillator in the sinus node. Um, we're finding that it really is a clock within a clock where rhythmic uh, variations of the clock BMAL transcription factors uh, result in circadian variations in ATN4 message and protein, which result in circadian variations in IF current density and circadian variation in heart rate, which could explain the occurrence of bradyarrhythmias at night. You'll be pleased to know that we're at the end of the talk. And so what have we learned in the last five years? Well, public participation in endurance events is on the rise. And more than ever, you have people participating in ultra endurance events like long distance marathons and triathlons. So several clinically relevant questions come to the fore. For example, is sport restriction advisable in some groups? What are the effects of detraining? And like Pheidippides, is it really a good idea to be the fittest man in town? 
And the question to the cardiologist is, are you about to witness a surge in the number of pacemaker implantations and arrhythmias as this population ages? Against this backdrop, we are the first to show that with training comes an intrinsic electrophysiological remodeling of the key pacemaking ion channel 8, 3, and 4, and this is sufficient stimulus for sinus bradycardia. In the long term, perhaps correlating with the duration, the intensity, perhaps against a backdrop of structural remodeling, the, res the remodeling isn't just restricted to the sinoatrial node, but occurs elsewhere in the heart. We have some preliminary evidence suggesting it might be occurring in the atria and the ventricles as well. We are starting to understand the upstream mechanisms that control this remodeling with specific em emphasis on microRNAs and transcription factors. And targeting these molecules might be the first step towards small molecule therapies for arrhythmogenesis in the athlete. And finally, there is an intrinsic circadian clock within the sinoatrial node that possibly controls the occurrence of bradyarrhythmias at night. So very important slide. I'm very fortunate to work with some incredibly talented people at the University of Manchester. Primary thanks go to my mentor, Professor Mark Boyett, who always encourages us to challenge the status quo and go where the science takes you. That's sort of an uh, option I'd recommend. A special thanks go to my colleague Yan Wen Wang, who did a lot of the circadian uh, clock electrophysiology, and my colleague Shu Nakao, who was heavily involved in the AV node work, and our technician Charlotte Cox, who painstakingly trains our animals. I'd like to thank our collaborators at home and abroad, especially in Norway and Maastricht and Milan. And of course, our funding sponsor was the British Heart Foundation and personal awards from Servier and the European Society of Cardiology. And thank you for listening.